when you can get in front of groups of people. And so whether it's a virtual event, a virtual summit, or you're getting on a podcast where you can share your message with many, or even live events are starting to come back, you definitely should figure out how you can incorporate speaking into your marketing mix in some way. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hello there and welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. If this is your first time with us on the My Future Business Show, the show that gets in front of uh, you in front of your best audience and keeps you there, you are in for a treat. So I'm on the line with the wonderful Mr. Brett Ridgway. Welcome to the show, Brett. It is my pleasure to be here today, Rick. Thanks so oh, much for having me. Absolutely. The pleasure is all, my, all mine, Brett. Now, you and I are going to be talking about key mistakes speakers and authors make when trying to build a speaking business and monetize their books. And on that, you're, you are, in fact, a best-selling author. You are a speaker and you are a consultant. We're going to be talking about those topics in some detail as we work through the call today, Brett. But uh, we also spend a bit of time, just for the sake of context, to learn a bit about uh, you. So where are you calling in from today? So I'm in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is in the Midwest, about four hours or so south of Chicago. So oh, beautiful. What do you love about the place? Changes of season, man. So Change? Yeah, you'd be heading Sometimes into... they're shorter, sometimes they're longer, but it's nice to have different seasons. <laughs> is it inspirational? Do you get around the, around the local area and does it give you any inspiration? I mean, I really enjoy the fall here, Rick, because mm. we have beautiful fall colors in, in Indiana. Uh, and I like the crisp mornings and then, yes. you know, warm up in the afternoon. Yes. You know, the, you know February is my favorite time of the year, but we get through that. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, tell me, was that where you grew up, Indiana? I was actually born in Ohio, oh. next state over to the east, and uh, moved, to, moved to Terre Haute in the third grade. My, my father worked for a company called Columbia House. Yes. If you remember the old ads and the TV guys and all that, you know. Yes, sir. Seven, seven cassettes for a penny type thing. Yes, <laughs> That, that was where he worked here in Terre Haute. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing. Now, I'd love to talk about uh, everything you're doing, including that sort of side of things, the marketing side. But before we do that, in our formative years, we often have people around us that, uh, I guess, uh, influence us greatly. Tell us a little bit about what growing up was like for you. You know, in my younger years, Rick, I was an avid runner. I competed throughout college. Uh, you know, compared to the average guy on the street, I was pretty good. Compared to the elite <laughs> runners, I was trash. But you know, I, 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 you know, I, I ran a 412 mile in my younger days, so I spent a lot of time in that arena. And then, so I, I enjoyed hiking. My wife and I recently took a trip to Israel and Jordan. Oh wow! And, and so I had to get back into walking to get my legs ready for that particular trip because. I, I've worn them out now, Rick. <laughs> running, running isn't part of the agenda anymore, but I can walk with the best of them. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to talk a bit about your travels and what you like to do there, but you, you touched on your father briefly there, and I'm wondering, um, as far as influential people go, people that, uh, again, in those formative years, really had an impact on you in terms of the, the person that you've become today. Who might who might that be? You know, I could think back to a, a couple actual college professors that had a profound impact on, on the, the path I took and all that. I was, uh, you know, I, I've been up there in years a little bit. So I gradu actually graduated with an MBA back in 1981, Rick. Mm -hmm. And just as I getting ready to graduate, a guy called me up and asked me, he got my name from somebody because I had volunteered to do a project for a college professor. And it was a pro the project was specifically about how computers might impact the funeral home industry. Oh. I mean, this is way be this is way before the internet and all that stuff. Yep. But I thought it'd be I thought it would be a, a good experience and all that. So I volunteered to do that project for the professor, and he subsequently gave my name to a local businessman who had founded a training company that did industrial maintenance training. And I didn't really have any particular path I was thinking about going down at that point in time. I I went on to get my MBA because I wasn't ready to work yet, right? Yeah, yeah. A bachelor's or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So I went ahead, I went ahead and got that. And then when this guy called me up, I said, you know, what the heck? I'll, so I was actually my first job out of school was selling high ticket industrial training via the telephone to military bases, power plants, you know, like General Motors facilities, yeah, etc. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't a, probably the most adept salesperson, 
but I helped him to build a multi-million dollar company and, you know, despite my lack of sales skills, had some success in that arena. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'd love to touch on those businesses that you've created because there are a number of them uh, that I've seen through your bio. In actual fact, I'm wondering, uh, along the way, you developed the first portal website in the plant engineering and maintenance industry back in 95. Is that uh, the one you've just talked about? Well, it resulted out of the training company that I was working ah, for. Ah, right. In the, I, I started in the early 80s with this gentleman, and in the early 90s to mid-90s, he decided that we should do some kind of multimedia program because it had mm -hmm. all been instructor-led training to that point in time. So I identified a product that I thought would make a good training DVD, CD, yep. and we developed that. And then the question was, well, how are we going to market this? <laughs> I mean, yes, yes, we had some industrial customers already, but you're talking, you know, in a given year, maybe a couple hundred and not a massive audience. So we decided we would go online to the, and do it via the Internet. And so that's when the first portal website went up. Yep. And I recognize that, you know, one company, you know, one product is not a company make. So I went out and made deals with McGraw Hill and other technical publishers where we were also reselling various books and other training programs aimed at the same niche that we had created our program in. Uh -huh. so that's where the, the portal website came about back in 1995, I believe it was. Yeah, great feedback. Thank you so much. Now, just swinging back a little bit to the uh, travel component of your life. What have you learned from travels, uh, you know, from a cultural perspective? Are there some commonalities that you've taken away? Uh, great question, Rick. Uh, I mean, I haven't done a ton of international traveling in my time. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of domestic travel because of the, the back of the room sales that we're handling for various seminars. Yep. And I mean, yeah, there's certainly some differences, uh, even within the United States from area to area about how outgoing people are, et cetera, but not, not a massive difference here in the States. Yeah. Yep. I yep. mean, I, I certainly experienced some of the massive differences when we traveled to the Middle East recently <laughs> in, in terms of various groups and how they handle things and et cetera. But uh, I'm not going to get political here. so I'll No, of me. course, of course not. No, look, so tell me, what do you do with yourself in your downtime? Do you enjoy relaxation? And how important is, is it uh, for you to relax? You know, I'm 64, Rick. My wife retired last year, and mm -hmm. she thinks I should retire. But the thought of getting up every morning and saying, all right, what the hell am I going to do today? Yeah, that's sounds, boring, isn't it? Sounds, so, uh, so unappealing to me. Yeah, I agree. So, so that's why I've decided to take on the, this newer challenge of, of branding myself versus doing everything for the fulfillment company that I had founded in the past. And so I'm pouring a lot of time into work right now, honestly. I mean, I love to walk the dog and I love to hike when I get a chance, but uh, squeezing <laughs> that in right now has been a little challenging. Oh, I bet it has. Tell me about your pets. What sort of dog do you have? Oh, I got a... a, a a kind of a boxer mastiff mix. He's a big old boy. Oh, I love it. Love big dogs. And then there's four four cats in the house too. Oh, <laughs> my my wife loves her cats. Do they do they get along with the dog? Uh, you know, by and large, <laughs> the cats get along fine with the dog, uh, but they don't get along so fine with each other. Each one. Oh, each of so. course, of course. So, given that uh, you are never retiring because uh, life's too interesting for that sort of thing, do you still find yourself getting up in in early in the morning? And what's a daily routine look like, look like for you? You know, actually, I, I find I'm getting up earlier now because the you know the personal branding and the getting into the speaking consulting and all of that is a, a fairly new gig for me. So, yep. I, I have formally separated from the speaker fulfillment services company that I founded 20 years ago, and let them go on, on their own way. And so that's kind of provided an actual revitalization. And, uh, you know, I'm actually coming in earlier than I used to and, you know, staying a little bit later. You, get, you know, when you're building your own yep, company, yep. you've got to commit as much time to it as it takes to do it right. And Absolutely. that isn't always eight to five and, you know, avoiding the weekends and all that. No, I know. I don't know who said it, but somebody prominent said it says that it's uh, being an entrepreneur is not all that it's cracked up to be because the good part about it is that you're boss, but the bad part about it is that you're also the boss. So what's right. uh, what's that what's that journey taught you thus far? Uh, you know, I used to be quite the introvert, Rick. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I had to learn along the way was, hey, I do have valuable knowledge to share with people. And you got to step outside of your own comfort zone and not be afraid to tackle those things. So while I was I was quite happy for, you know, ten or twelve years being the back of the room guy behind the scenes. I realized that I needed to step out up front and get on the stage with those guys that we were providing services for. And so, 
I had to develop the, I don't know what skills or whatever it is, but the fortitude to get up in front of the room and share what I knew and not just kind of hide behind the scenes, so to speak. You've got to walk the walk, don't you? Yes, you do. I noticed that you have a incredible list of people that you've worked with, many of which I've seen speak myself. And I look at them and I think, I could never do that. And you mentioned moments ago that you're somewhat of an introvert. How does someone break away from that if they want to become a speaker? Where does this newfound confidence grow from? You know, I think the main thing to developing that confidence is knowing your subject well. Mm -hmm. And you're just like we're doing here today, Rick, is just having a conversation about it. I mean, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be pushy or overly aggressive or anything. It's just sharing what you know. And some people will resonate with you and others won't. And, you know, you got to just got to come from the mindset of, you know, somebody, if you're not somebody's cup of tea, next. I mean, next, yep. you know, it's not something that you're going to sweat over and spend losing sleep over. Yeah. Do you find yourself still learning from people that around you that it maybe have done as long as you have? Oh, always learning. I mean, yeah. I, I've been, you know, I've probably read five books in the last two weeks. And oh, wow. You know, you know, part of this new adventure is continuing to educate yourself. And there are viewpoints that people have that I don't have necessarily. And it's like, yeah, I probably should talk about that in some shape or form because it's valuable knowledge that people need to know. So, yeah, I'm always educating myself about new things coming up and how various people are approaching the topic, whether it's getting gigs or selling from the back of the room or whatever it may be. Do you enjoy audio books or are you a hardback type person? I'm a hardback type person. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So um, you, as an author yourself, I'd love to talk more about your speaking in a moment, but just let's pivot there because I think it's timely. How many books have you actually written? I know you're a bestseller. Tell us a little bit about that background. Well, I've written seven books, all in the, I would call the speaker, author, information marketer, event promoter niche. So and, you know, anybody in the expert space trying to sell the knowledge that they have is who those various books are aimed at. Mm -hmm. And the first book actually was written about 15 years ago and it developed out of the back of the room experience where we were providing the back of the room sales support for various internet marketing promoters. And so that first book was actually called View from the Back, 101 Tips for Event Promoters Who Want to Dramatically Increase Their Back of the Room Sales. That led to the second book because we were providing fulfillment services for a lot of those big names in the industry. Mm -hmm. And that was the second book was the 50 biggest mistakes I see information marketers make. And both of those books are, you know, while they're a good 10 or more years old, they're, they're still very timely in terms of the content of those. Yeah, absolutely. The third book was uh, called 50 biggest website mistakes. And I had a guy who wanted to co-author a book. And so he provided honestly, most of the technical content for that Rick. Mm -hmm. But I did most of the writing to make it clean and all that. And then that led to a book that I did with a guy named Rick Frischman and a business partner called Mistakes Authors Make. And that was the first number one bestseller. And while the book was co-authored for marketing purposes, I actually did all the, the writing of, <laughs> all the writing of the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, that... it was fun because we actually lost that one live at an event to try to take it to you know, number one status. And, you know, it's one of those things where you're either going to have egg on your face or it's going to work. And yeah, it's going to work. work. Now, a lot of people have this aversion to co-authoring. You know, there are times where you won't know all about the topic that you're trying to write about. Is it is it still a viable option for a new author to co-author? Oh, yes. And if somebody's having trouble getting started, think about, you know, one of the collaboration books where you're just contributing one chapter to it. Yeah, just, to get them. Your, just to get your feet wet. Yep. Absolutely. I'm, I'm absolutely loving this. Now, out of all the skills that you have, and, and, the, and the list is long, what is the one thing that you reckon that you do the best? What's your, I guess, for lack of better ways to put it, your superpower? You know, stay you humble. I mean, relationship marketing is probably the biggest key to my success over the years. I mean, fortunately, I was in a great position where I was able to meet a lot of speakers and event promoters early in the game, you know, when mm -hmm. the internet and information marketing live event industries were kind of just starting out. Yep. And so I, I got a lot of people in my corner early on and, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to sound egotistic or anything, but I am no, no. who I am. And, and, yeah, yeah, and so, yeah. you know, for whatever reason, right or wrong, it resonated with people. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm an honest guy, I got to say. And so I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I will, you know, do whatever is necessary to make something right. If something isn't going the way it should be and just keep moving forward. 
Thank you very much for the feedback, Brett. I really appreciate it. Now, if anybody, just just um, as an aside, if you want to see some of the calibre, and I'm, I'm telling you, there's some pretty big names on this list. If you want to um, um, check them out, just so you get some, I guess, a credibility feel, like, not that you're going to need one, we're going to be sharing the website link back to Brett, uh, Brett and all of his work uh, in a little while. But um, tell me some about some of the companies and brands that you've personally created, Brett. Yeah, so the company that was formed out of the, the back of the room experience, basically because I put up that first portal website in the plant engineering maintenance mm -hmm. bit, yep. when some of the speakers found out that we were doing product fulfillment, one of them cornered me at an event and say, hey, will you do some fulfillment for me? Because it's not the best use of my time. No. And I'd been thinking about it for a while because it was a natural outgrowth of all the people I had gotten to know in the industry. And so that's when the company Speaker Fulfillment Services was formally put together back in 2003. And it's still going strong today. Now it's actually in the midst of a rebranding right now because a lot of the clients are no longer people who consider themselves speakers. And so the, the, the rebranded name is actually Get Shipped Done for that particular <laughs> company. Love it. But along the way, there, there were various sub-brands created under the Speaker Fulfillment Services umbrella, and that included Ship Your Books, which was for fulfillment, just a book for authors. Uh, Booklets Deliver, which is a print-on-demand service of small booklets for content providers. Yep. Uh, Disc Deliver, which did CDs and DVDs on demand in a custom mm -hmm. self-mailer. Now, I'll be honest, that industry's largely gone away, Rick, because most people don't use CDs and DVDs anymore. No, no. But, but, it, but in certain niches, they're still very much used. I mean, for example, yep. in, the, in the fitness niche where people want to pop a DVD into their you know, player and watch it on the big screen TV to work out. You yep. still have, have some months where there's thousands of DVDs still ship out in that particular niche. But, you know, but by and large, you know, by we don't need yeah. nearly as many as, as we used to do. Yep. And then, you know, because our fulfillment processes were developed, you can run a lot more than just books through a fulfillment process. Of course. So, so supplements, you know, ship my supplements or ship your supplements was developed. And so just kind of most things in that, again, the speaker, author, information marketer niche were the primary types of products that will run through that particular system. Great feedback. Again, if you're on the call today and you're wanting to learn more about those, we will be sharing the links back to those. Now, let's go and wind back the pages of time a little bit. Tell us a little bit about uh, the late, great uh, Gary Halbert's Hurricane Andrew seminar and how it changed your life. Oh, you know, it was the impetus for everything that developed out of that because mm. that, that event he put on as a, a charity fundraiser for victims of Hurricane Andrew back in 1992 or three down in Key West. Time flies, doesn't and it? And I, I was still working for the industrial training company at that time. So mm. the guy who owned that company took me down there to that seminar with him. And that's where I first met, you know, Carl Giletti and, and Brad Anton and Ted Nicholas and, and a lot of the, a lot of the big names at that time. Yes. And that that chance meeting of Carl Galetti at that event led to a joint venture with him where I actually put together his marketing book catalog, classic marketing books, and put it online. And because of that relationship, when he did his first internet marketing super conference in 1999, that's when he called me up and asked me if I'd handle the back of the room sales table for him. Now, I, I honestly didn't even know what backroom sales meant at that time. <laughs> yep. But I, I hadn't been to Las Vegas before, so it sounded good to me. And so that, that got us started into the whole business of providing the crew. And in many cases, Rick, more importantly, the merchant account that could handle a large sum of money in a short period of time across multiple speakers as a service that was provided to the information and internet marketing industries. Yeah, so that's, well, where I, that's where I got to know all the speakers. So. That's very pioneering, cutting edge uh, at, during that time. That would have been very exciting. Now, again, I'd love to come back to this. I've seen many of the people that you've mentioned on your website who uh, who are speakers, and I've seen them live. You know, you've got the likes of Mike Filsaim, Ryan Dice, Joe Polish, and the list goes on and on and on. What is it like to work with such high caliber individuals? Well, most of them are pretty well down to earth. I mean, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. You know, what, what was great was being behind the scenes. We got to see what they did well, what they didn't do so well, both in terms of the products that they created and how they wrap things together into a product bundle. Now, now keep in mind, of course, Rick, that back in the early days of speaker fulfillment services, it was all about the big box package, all about pump value. Yep. So the product, you know, had 10 CDV, CDs in yeah, it, yeah. 10 DVDs, three big manuals, and it was all about thump. 
<laughs> that, day, that day, by and large, is entirely gone. I mean, mm. you see a few products now that have a few components in them, but most of the industry has gone to digital delivery for the majority of their content. Yep. And so, you know, the business had to shift over the years. And so we started going after more authors and just handling the book fulfillment because books aren't going away. Mm -hmm. So we still ship, you know, thousands of books per month and had to transition to also doing, you know, things like you know, swag kits for people. So if you're putting on a live event and you want to reward your attendees or you have a membership program, coaching program where people are paying you high ticket and you want to stay in front of them, then you send them some swag, whether it's t-shirts, mugs, journals, Mitch. books, whatever. Just something to keep your name in front of them. Uh, a good colleague of mine is a guy named Armin Morn, and I don't know if you run across Armin before or not, but mm -hmm. he has the largest, run, longest running internet coaching program in the industry. Been going for 20 years or whatever, and yep. has hundreds of people paying him a significant sum of money monthly to be in his coaching program. Well, obviously, because he's teaching internet marketing, the majority of the content is delivered online. Online, yep. But he recognizes the value of being in front of them physically in some form. So he sends them an actual physical magazine once per month with various articles of interest in that particular niche. And that's a good reminder to his audience about the value that he continues to bring them and why they should remain a member. So uh, yes. you know, diving into the digital only pond is a very dangerous game to play for a speaker or an information marketer. And this is why I was going to ask you about different pillars for different reasons. Um, I, I consider having a book as one pillar of your marketing strategy. Tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, the overall strategy that you would employ and, and encourage others to consider. Well, I, first of all, I think you should have multiple books. and mm -hmm. But you gotta, always got to keep in mind that a book is the lead product. It's not where you're going to make your money unless you're Joe Polish and you can become a Wall Street you know, bestseller <laughs> with, with your new book or whatever. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, but a pillar is a definite key element for any speaker, information marketer, author, but the money's on the back end, as we all know, Rick. And so yep. you've got to take the time to develop those back end core programs, whether it's mentoring, one on one coaching, group coaching, masterminds, you know, ongoing webinar series, whatever it may be, because that's where your real money's going to be made. And Absolutely. Yep. So, yeah, books are a key pillar, but, you know, social media is an important part, but I'm still trying to decide myself honestly how important of a part it is yeah it makes you wonder doesn't it you know you, or you often hear people saying well look certain social platforms are particularly for you know mixing and mingle with family and friends so why would you want this nasty marketer coming along and yeah. <laughs> trying to promote something you know i still juggle that ball all the time and you know i just signed up for an instagram account only about three weeks ago for the first oh wow time. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a little I'm a little late to the game in that particular niche, and I and I uh, look, still haven't played on TikTok because I'm not sure how that really works. <laughs> well, you're not the only one. Let me assure you. Now, um, we've talked about introversion and extroversion. I'm wondering if um, it was speaking uh, or has speaking become more, I guess, natural for you as time's gone by, or was it? Did, did you find it difficult when you started out? Oh, yeah, I definitely found it difficult because there was a lack of confidence in my ability to get up and, and, and enunciate properly and deliver mm -hmm. a, a good message for the audience. Now, over time, just the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it, the better you yep. know your subject matter. And so, I mean, our conversation this afternoon is totally unscripted and I, you know, I don't think I'm stumbling over my tongue too much. So no, not at all. <laughs> Love it. Now, anyone, obviously, then given the, the list of people that I've seen, everybody from the big names to those who are just starting out, can they be speakers? You think they can get well, over that fear factor? Oh, sure. And, and, and speaking is a great way to get your message out there to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're doing one on one coaching or telephone consulting or whatever it may be, you know, it's one-on-one, -on -one, and so you're a chance to impact a greater number of people and have a more positive impact on the world is amplified greatly when you can get in front of groups of people. And so whether it's a virtual event, a virtual summit, or you're getting on a podcast where you can share your message with many, or even live events that are starting to come back, yeah, mm -hmm. you definitely should figure out how you can incorporate speaking into your marketing mix in some way. So tell us, uh, there'd be a lot of people on the call today, Brett, that would be interested in learning more about you and connecting with you, but what type of people do you work with? So the majority of the people that I'm focusing on my efforts on these days are business people and entrepreneurs who want to develop speaking as a second career. 
So they have the expertise, they've had success in the marketplace and whatever their niche is. And now they kind of have a second calling, so to speak. Yeah. So there's a lot that can trip you up in the speaking industry. And so because of my fairly unique position behind the scenes from handling the sales table, where I've probably seen a couple thousand different speakers over time, mm-hmm. and from handling the product fulfillment for these big names and seeing what they do well and don't do so well, mm-hmm. you know, I, I kind of have a pretty good sense about what pieces you need to put into place to build a profitable speaking business. And so that's where the majority of my efforts are this in the, that arena this day, these days. Yep. Uh, but I also love talking about books and mistakes authors make and all that. So if somebody is an author and they want to learn what not to do, I, I'm quite comfortable speaking about that also. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, given what you've seen uh, throughout time, what makes a talk interesting and engaging, do you think? Storytelling? Well, yeah, the, the key 100% is storytelling. I mean, people relate to stories, and so the mm-hmm. more stories you can incorporate from your personal experience into your talk where there's a valid lesson associated with the story, obviously, then, you know, the better off you are. I mean, years ago, I was at an event, Rick, and, and I sat and watched a, a friend of mine get carted away in the ambulance. Oh. And, you know, it was, you know, everybody was nervous and scared for him. But I looked over and saw the event promoter on the side, and he was probably more scared than most because that guy getting carted away in the ambulance was scheduled to be his next speaker on his agenda. Oh. So he's sitting there, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I have a big empty slot in my, in my agenda now. I don't want to tap dance for 90 minutes to keep people occupied. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that's where the concept I call the back pocket speech comes into play. And if you're a speaker in an event and you can come up and offer a second talk, oh, then that provides great value for the promoter and makes you a hero. So that's, you know, that's a story that I try to incorporate into when I'm speaking about the speaking industry because I've seen it from personal experience. Yeah, fantastic. I wonder, I've, I've sat and let's just use Ryan Dice again for an example. I was sat there and I felt intuitively that he was reading the room and he would change tack um, midway through a, I guess, somewhat of a very structured presentation to actually, I guess, follow that feeling of the crowd. How important is intuition and in being able to shift gears and do that sort of thing? You know, I think it's fairly important. The key is to develop some interactivity into your presentation, whether it's, you know, audience polls or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like to do a little icebreaker at the beginning of my stage presentations because of my back of the room experience. I actually have everybody stand up and turn the face to the back of the room and tell them I'm more comfortable talking to them that way because I'm more used to seeing the back of their heads in the front of them at an event. <laughs> But I, I think storytelling is critical, and I, I think having some type of interactivity so that there's some type of response is critical. I mean, yeah, I think you need to be able to read the room to some extent. I'm not going to say that it's a craft that I've mastered fully myself, honestly, Rick, but I, I do think it's important. What I think is more important, honestly, is doing your homework in advance of an event and figuring out what the demographics of your audience are as much as possible. Yep. I mean, whether it's a corporate speaking event, you know, finding out who the movers and shakers are going to be at the event, and finding out what their key pain points are so that you can work them into your talk in some form, or whether it's a multi-speaker event, doing your homework up front as to who else is speaking at that event, what are they talking about, if they're selling from the platform, what's their price point, etc. I mean, I was at an event a few years ago where the guy had three speakers all about copywriting. Now, Ugh. while copywriting is a valuable subject, if you were the third speaker on that topic, your chances <laughs> of selling anything from the back of the room were about zero because <laughs> they'd already you know, been there, done that, heard that, and they weren't interested in anything more about copywriting. So, yeah, do, your homework, great, do your homework. Great feedback. I wonder, is there a place for humor? Say again? In, is there a place for humor in, in speaking? I, yeah, oh, definitely. And uh, I'm not the greatest humorist, certainly. Uh, <laughs> Me well, that's, that's why I try to use that icebreaker I mentioned at the beginning to kind of, you know, build a little rapport or whatever. I mean, I think you got to be very careful with humor. And if you're a speaker, be very careful not to, how do you say it, use the same joke that somebody else on the platform has already used. Uh, and I've, uh, I've seen it before. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're a hit and run speaker, then you don't have a chance to really gauge the audience, see what they're reacting to, not reacting to, see what other speakers are talking about. I mean, if you get into that situation, like I mentioned, where you're the third speaker on a given topic, 
ah, you're in massive trouble. You turn, aren't you? Absolutely. Now, I'd love to mention Russell Brunson. He talked about back of room rush and having that story that, I guess, takes them to that point where they just cannot resist rushing mm -hmm. to the back of the stage. Now, how does that come about? Well, you know, I think a good presentation should be 80 to 85% content and no more than 10 to 15% close. Mm. And you've really got to establish rapport throughout. I mean, I've seen speakers, Rick, who had great rapport, but when you got down to really truly analyzing the content they delivered, there wasn't much there. Not much there. And so while they initially sold well from the back of the room, you had tremendous refund rates because people realized you know, there really isn't content here. Yeah, he got me hyped and excited for a minute, but they didn't, you know, after it was all said and done, they didn't really see the value long term other than that temporary high that they got. So you can't just build a temporary high. They've got to see the value that you bring to them long term, and you've got to create value in their mind that it's like, well, this is a no-brainer type thing. Now, I do, yeah, I mean, I do want to caution speakers out there that make sure you're not selling a product that isn't yet developed on the stage. Mm -hmm. you know, I was at an event a few years ago where this guy did a mass, a massive table rush, like to the tune of $375,000. I mean, it was a lot nice. of money. Nice. Yep, yep. But he was selling the latest, greatest magic blue pill for developing websites or something. So, this, I mean, this maybe goes back eight, ten years. Yep. And as it turned out, the product wasn't fully developed and then developed some kind of bug that they couldn't fix. Oh. So they had to refund every penny of $375,000. Oh, no. I mean, it was a massive blow to their credibility, and it, you know, hurt the promoter, like I, like hell. I bet it and, did. You know, yep, yeah, yep. giving back half of eight three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars is a major pain in the pocketbook. That's a bad day, isn't it? <laughs> For sure, yeah, that's, that's a bad day. Now, I uh, I wonder, do you have a favorite book yourself? Oh, good question. You know, I just so Joe, many. I just, I just read Joe Polish's new book. Uh, Yep. What's in it? What's in it for them? I don't know. If you haven't read that, I would recommend it fully. I think it will become quote, the Bible about relationship marketing because I think relationship marketing is the biggest key to business success. It's the people you know and the people that know you that will really propel your career ahead and whatever your your field is. It, yeah, it's those relationships. And you've got to nurture them. And you've got to get, you've got to come in with a humble "What can I do for you?" attitude and not about "What can you do for me." Yeah, absolutely. Great sage feedback there. Now, I'm, I'm wondering, do you have uh, pen to paper at the moment? Are you writing any, any more books? I actually have a book that is uh, at the publisher right now in manuscript mm -hmm. form. Started the, started the process today to get all the final pieces in place. It's called yep. How to Build a Profitable Speaking Business, 21 Tips for Entrepreneurs Who Want to Dramatically or Who Want to Take Their Speaking Business to the Next Level. And it will come out sometime, hopefully early next year. I'm pushing them to speed up as much as possible, but <laughs> they've got they've got their timelines they need to work on. So I need to respect that, obviously. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, probably mid next year is when it will actually come out. But that's it is what it is. I will push along as best I can. There are lots of business owners that will be on this uh, call today looking for information about how to connect you uh, connect with you. And I guess what's the onboarding when they start working with you and where can they find you? You know, the first thing I would recommend to people is just have a conversation and just go to brettridgeway.com and that's Brett with one T and Ridgeway without an E. Yep. And if you click on the contact link there, there's a calendar link there that you can hop on my schedule and I'm happy to chat with you. Uh, if you're interested in finding out when the new book's going to be released, you can go to buildaprofitableSpeakingBusiness.com and just let me know that, hey, let me know when the book's ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. <laughs> and then I'll actually, I'm actually planning to start a podcast myself after the first year called Spotlight on Speaking. Excellent. And where I'll be interviewing speakers about their speaking journey and some tips they want to share. And then a tip or two from the new book that's coming out. And so if you're interested in being, talking about your speaking journey, then that's spotlightonspeaking.com is the preliminary website. 
Excellent. Thank you for your feedback, Brett. If you're on this call today, you've enjoyed what you've heard, you want to learn more about speaking, or you want to get your hand on uh, uh, Brett's books, there are several of them for you to access and also access all of the other businesses that Brett has founded and are wonderfully successful. Uh, um, visit brettridgeway.com. I'll spell that out for you. It'll be a clickable link, so you don't have to worry about any of that. That'll be below this post, no matter where you see this call today. And with that, Brett, this has just been a fantastic insight for call. Thank you so very much for joining me on the show today. Well, thank you so much, Rick. My pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends, and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.